shock. This is the fourth lecture in the trauma lecture series and the objectives of this lecture are to define shock, to learn how to differentiate the types of shock or causes of shock, to correlate clinical science with the type of shock and the severity, to determine the emergency treatment and how fluid management is done in trauma. And the skills to learn in the skill stations are central line insertion, peripheral line insertion, and insertion of interosseous access, and complications related to these procedures. Shock is defined as a cardiovascular abnormality resulting in inadequate organ perfusion and tissue oxygenation. Causes of shock can be identified in the history depending on the presentation of the patient. Hemorrhage is the commonest cause of shock in trauma. Before we embark on a discussion of shock, it's important to review cardiac physiology. Cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. And the determinants of cardiac output are the preload, that is the end diastolic volume, the contractility, that is the power of contraction of the heart, and the afterload, which is peripheral resistance. In hemorrhage, the cause of shock is loss of blood volume, which can be either internal or external, and that leads to loss of preload. And in cases where the blood volume is lost, we cannot use vasopressors. They are ineffective, and what we need to do is to increase the preload by by volume replacement. The body responds to blood loss by vasoconstriction and tachycardia. And at the tissue level, at the cellular level, there is uh, tissue hypoxia, which leads to metabolic acidosis. But if this persists for long, it will lead to progressive cell damage. This slide shows different classes of shock. The first one is hemorrhagic shock, and that's the most important and the commonest. But we also do have other causes that can occur in trauma, cardiogenic shock, neurogenic shock, and septic shock. Neurogenic and septic shock can be classified together as distributive shock. And then we have another common type of shock in trauma that is obstructive shock that can occur in cardiac tamponade and tension pneumothorax. Uh, two topics we'll look at when we discuss uh, chest injuries. Initial management of a patient in shock follows the same process of uh, management, that is primary survey, where we are concerned with the airway and breathing first before we come to circulation, because as alluded to earlier, airway and breathing problems take precedence of uh, circulation. But in patients with shock, we must focus especially on circulation, where we determine whether there is any external bleeding. We check the pulse and blood pressure, and we determine what the pulse pressure is and what the capillary refill is. Capillary refill is a good indicator of peripheral perfusion. And we also check for altered level of consciousness, which can occur in decreased cerebral perfusion as a result of shock. And we expose the patient to check whether there are any other injuries and whether there are any bleeding sites so that you can be able to stop any further blood loss. There are four classes of hemorrhagic shock and we look at this in some detail. The first class is when this 15% loss of blood. Class 2, 15 to 30%. Class 3, 30 to 40%. And class 4, greater than 40% blood loss. And the blood loss can be as a result of injury with the external or internal blood volume loss, or there can be injury to tissues leading to tissue edema and loss of intravascular volume. There are four parameters we look at when we consider hemorrhagic shock. The first one is the definition of the shock itself, volume and percentage loss. Shock affects the pulse rate, the blood pressure and pulse pressure, and the mental status of a patient, and also the urine output. In fact, urine output is a very good indicator of tissue perfusion and should be monitored early.
and this table shows those presentations in some detail in class one shock the blood loss is about 750 mils that's about 15 percent blood volume in this class there is no increase in pulse rate and the blood pressure usually is normal in class 2 shock the loss is about 1.5 liters or 3 units and the blood volume loss is about 30 percent and there is usually an increase in the pulse rate but the blood pressure remains normal and this should illustrate to us that blood pressure is not a good indicator of early shock and we should not depend on it class 3 shock the loss is between 30 and 40 percent up to about four units of blood and there's usually an increased pulse rate of about 120 and a decrease in blood pressure and in class 4 which is the worst class of shock the loss is more than 40 percent and that is more than four units of blood and the pulse rate is markedly increased and the blood pressure is markedly reduced these classes further present with changes in pulse pressure, urine output, and the mental status as shown in this table. And in class 1, the pulse pressure is normal, but in class 2, the pulse pressure is decreased as it is in class 3 and markedly decreased in class 4. In the urine output, normal urine output is usually between 30 to 50 mils per hour, and it is normal in class 1, but decreased to 20 to 30 mils in class 2, decreased to 5 to 15 mils in class 3, and there is hardly any urine output in class 4. The mental status is uh, usually normal in class 1, but uh, the patient might be anxious in class 2, might be confused in class 3, shock, and usually lethargic, confused, and even comatose in class 4. And the fluid treatment that is required. In the first two classes, normal saline and ringus lactate are adequate, but also, of course, the stoppage of any further blood loss. But in class three and four, blood is uh, necessary as well. And class three and four might also require operation to stop any further blood loss. Look for the cool tachycardic patient a patient who is cool and tachycardic has got hemorrhagic shock unless proved otherwise. In spite of the parameters we've defined above, there are some pitfalls in diagnosis which we'll look at later. But now we we'll look at some of the ways to manage a patient in hemorrhagic shock. We should remember that uh, hematocrit and hemoglobin levels are not good indicators of blood loss or the severity of shock because Compensatory mechanisms take time to set in. The initial management of a patient in shock, we look at the airway where we ensure the patient has a patent airway and that we might also need to put a definitive airway. We support the breathing if need be with a number bag and we must also give supplemental oxygen. In circulation, we stop the bleeding, we replace any volume lost and we put a urinary catheter to monitor urine output and monitor perfusion. We might also put a central venous line to check central venous pressure. In D, disability, the patient might have an altered level of consciousness as a result of decreased cerebral perfusion. And we need to manage this and support the air and ventilation. And uh, we also need to determine whether loss of consciousness is not associated with a head injury and when we expose the patient we must be aware not to, to make the patient hypodermic. Patients in shock are especially prone to hypodermia because blood is the main distributor of heat in the body and when there is blood loss then there is less the effect of the blood to distribute heat. Secondly, usually most people give cold fluids that further worsen hypothermia and the third thing is uh, in shock there's decreased metabolism and that leads to uh, hypothermia so we must make sure that we especially we watch out for hypothermia
any patient who is in shock until we have warmed them and determined that they are not responsive we cannot say they are dead so patient is not dead until warm and dead in the initial fluid management we need first of all to get vascular access using two large bore peripheral lines as per Pozel's law which states that the rate of flow is proportional to the fourth power of the radius of the cannula and is inversely related to its length. So the shorter the cannula, the better the perfusion. And for this reason, central lines are not as good at infusion of fluids as uh, peripheral lines are. In children, we should get intracious access. The fluids that we give is uh, one to two liters fluid bolus or 20 mils per kg in pediatrics and we usually give ringus lactate and nomocelline and then whole blood and packed red blood cells and after giving two liters of fluid for adults we then reassess for response and what we as reassess is the vital signs and depending on the vital signs there are three types of responses which we we'll look at we also assess the urine output we do arterial blood gases to check acid-base balance and usually in shock patients have respiratory alkalosis because of tachypnea and metabolic acidosis because of tissue hypoxia and very important also is to consult the surgical team early because patients in shock might require surgery there are three types of response after this resuscitation, these types of response can be illustrated graphically. And the first one is rapid and stable response where the patient's vital signs stabilize and remain stable. The second type is where the vital signs stabilize but don't stay stable so that they deteriorate after some time. And such a patient, the cause could be continued losses and also there's need for more fluids to be given and even blood and in the third type of response actually there is no response at all and this is what might be seen in severe shock like in class 4 and in these cases operation is urgently required this lecture on shock will be continued thank you